is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. We'll be continuing on today in our study of the letter of James, uh, this being the 12th part of that study. That's correct. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Look, Zooming right along. Look, look forward to all of them. Hallelujah. Uh, we're going to pick up and, and start in James chapter 4, verse 12, which is basically where we left off last week. But before we do that, I'm going to let Alice ask for God's blessing on our time together. Thank you, Lord. Father, we do. We bless you. We praise you. We worship you. We thank you, Father. We thank you in and for all things. And Lord, we just ask that this word that we hear today will, will go into our hearts Amen. and out of our mouths and touch our lives so that it can be changed and come to you and grow in you. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 That's what we need. We need to hear the word, we need to obey the word, we need to do the word, and we need to share the word. Amen. Make sure you got them all. Okay. <laughs> all right, you ready? Yes, sir. James 4.12. There is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and to destroy. But who are you who judge your neighbor? For the Lord is our judge, the Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king. He will save us. That's what it says. That's what the prophet Isaiah said. Isaiah 33, 22. Uh, I remember back in 1975 that there was, in the United States, there was, when television was quite a bit different, mm -hmm. there was a miniseries. Uh, I, I, I don't remember what it was called. I think it was called Moses the Lawgiver. Oh, the Lord, yes, that was it. Yeah. And it starred Burt Lancaster as Moses. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's nice that they're putting something fairly scriptural on television, but the simple fact of the matter is, and get this, Moses is not the lawgiver. He was the one that the law was given to, to transmit to us, but he's not the giver of it. So, in order for us to work for us, when God is pouring his word into us, writing, pouring his love into our hearts, writing his word on the tablets of our heart, we have to become invisible. That's right. We have to become nothing. We have to decrease. That, like John the Baptist. John the Baptist said, He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all, but he who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. John 3, 30 and 31. And I know I've shared this before, but I'll do it again quickly. Uh, we were overseas one year, I think. Well, it must have been seven years ago. Wow. Must have been almost exactly seven years ago. Because we had been, I'd been teaching in Kenya. Uh, we, and we're spending time in England and Wales and Scotland and flown over to Kenya to minister there for a while to teach a, a group of pastors. Right. And it, it just so happened that it was while we were there, it was my birthday. And they threw a birthday party for me. Yes, which, they did. Which was really, really a blessing. So really, really sweet brothers and sisters. Yeah. But when we returned, we went to Wales, and we went to a um, a conference in Wales. That was a true, true blessing. Uh, a blessing. It was started by our dear brother, now going on to his reward, Arthur Burke. Went home. Went home. Hallelujah. We will see him again. We will see him again. And while we were there in the in the conference, you know, different people get up to speak, and I had been, and somehow the topic got on eternity. Some got on the, the simple fact of the matter that God had created everything that we can see, literally out of nothing. I mean, that's what true creation is. It's not building something with something. It's starting from scratch. I mean, building from nothing. And but it just it, it touched me, probably because it was my birthday, and I'm sitting there thinking, at the time I was 70 years old, right. and I was very, very conscious of the fact that God wasn't through with me yet. <laughs> I mean, you know, may we all be conscious of that fact. He's still working on us. So I said to the Lord, I said, I'm paraphrasing, I may have been a little more, I said, 
Lord, what's up? Why, after 70 years of working on me, am I not finished? And I heard, I heard that still small voice that I know so well, and he said, because you're not nothing yet. He creates out of nothing. We have to decrease how far, how much, to the point where we are nothing, that he might be everything. Only Jesus. Only Jesus. You know, we are blessed because God has given us the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Right? Yes. Not only the gifts, but probably more importantly, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Because he said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, you'll know them by their fruit. Mm -hmm. So, but if you realize that, those, that, that fruit in, in our life, that, that love, that joy, joy that Peace, that patience, that went on and on and on. You, you know, go read it. Goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, kindness, self control. Now you don't have to read it. Hallelujah. <laughs> but that's God working in us and through us. It's not us. That's right. You know, we can't take credit for operating in the, in the fruit or the gifts of the Holy Spirit because it's not us. It's Him doing the work in us and through us, right? I mean, we have a, a human tendency, a natural human tendency, to attribute, well, if you go out and eat the taste of the meal to the waiter, because he's the one you see, he's the one that delivers it, right? But it's not him that prepared the meal, it's a chef in the background, you know, somebody else doing the work. Well, that's like us, we can't take credit. All we are doing is delivering the presence of God. And it's God who does the work, and it's God who needs to get the glory. Don't lose sight of that fact ever at all. Because you see, I think probably one of the number one heresies of mankind, fallen mankind, of humankind, is that, and it causes so much division, by the way. Mm -hmm. We think that we are the standard. I mean, you know, in the natural man, I think I'm the standard by which everything is judged. Measured. Yeah, everything is measured by what we think and do and say. Our dear brother Mark is here with us by video, and uh, Mark is a lovely brother. He's been with us a lot, spent years working with us, but the simple fact of the matter is, he's too tall. <laughs> but he doesn't think so. He thinks he's just right. Because <laughs> <laughs> Mark is a good... too short. <laughs> Mark is a good half foot taller than me. I don't know exactly amount. Uh, he's a tall guy. But if I stop and think, well, I'm the right size. Everybody else is the wrong size. You're either a little too tall or a little too little. I'm it. That's the kind of thing that actually takes place in our life, in a natural man. We think that we are the measure of everything and that everything is measured against, right? The, the heresy is to say, I am the standard by which other things are judged. That's not true. It's a not. No. We are judged. The standard is Jesus Christ. And hallelujah, though we haven't reached that place where we are, just like Jesus Christ yet, that is the grand promise mm. of our Father, Abba Father, because he has promised us in Romans, in the letter to Romans, in the 8th chapter, he said, this is whom he foreknew he predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, Christ Jesus. He is the potter, we are the clay. He is molding us and shaping us to make us just like his son, Jesus Christ. What a, what a great promise. Amen. So let's just get that straight, and then we're going to move on to verse 13, James 4, 13. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city, and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet, you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. We, we don't know. We, you know, it's, it's a, a pride to think that we know what's going to happen in the natural tomorrow. I can tell you what's going to happen long term. Because this is about what God is doing and what God has done, not about me. Mm -hmm. what, what has happened is I will look like Jesus Christ. 
And the word, the promise of the word is, when I see him as he is, I will be. I will be as he is. That's what I have. That's my future. That's that's what I have to look forward to. That's what you have to look forward to if you are in Christ Jesus. Amen. What a glorious, glorious promise. But remember, it, it says in Proverbs sixteen nine that the mind of man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. So. James here is speaking to the issue of self-interest mm -hmm. when he says we were a vapor that appears for a little while. David, a man after God's own heart, yes, he was. anointed as king over Israel, said, Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, mm -hmm. and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Salah. Oh, Psalm 39.5. What is the breath? This time here, I mean, we're so consumed with what's going on in our lives here and now. That's because we don't have our minds set on the things above. We don't, we don't have a clear picture of what eternity literally means in our life. And I want eternity. Job said the same thing, because before David, Job had said, remember that my life is but breath. Job 7.7. 7. But the truth is, and yet, even now, we are living in eternity. It's not somewhere out in front of us. We're in it. God has set eternity on our heart, is what the Word says. And if we appraise all things spiritually and set our minds on the things of the Spirit, the things above, then it'll be like this. David prayed, and I tell you, this psalm is so important in my life. I'm going to read from Psalms 8, verses 3 through 6. David said, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you take thought of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than God, and you crown him with glory and majesty. You make him to rule over the works of your hands. You have put all things under his feet. That's where we are now. Amen. Yes. Think of where we're going. Think of the glory that awaits us. Think of the presence of God that awaits us. I'll, I'll give you a minute to get excited, get up and we'll do a little dance there. Do a little jig. So instead of saying that, James goes on in verses 15 and 16 and said, Instead, you ought to say, If the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. I have to tell you, this is something that God impressed on me, and I've been more conscious of doing it. I mean, we have a blog, you know, we write on our Bible Talk website, and I'll, I'll say, well, I'm going to film today. I said, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. Lord willing, I'm going to do this. Lord willing, we'll be teaching about this. Because you know what? He's in charge. And he can change anything that I thought I had planned just like that. Absolutely. And when God changes his plan, or he's probably not changing his plan, I'm just becoming conscious of it, all right? He hasn't changed his plan. He's just, you're seeing it. I'm seeing it more clearly, That's yes. Right. Yeah. And I don't want to defend my plan against his, no. all right? So so please note this well. Note the mm -hmm. You are not in charge of your own life. No, not at all. You're not in charge of your life. If you think you are, then you are in rebellion to the Lord God Almighty. And repent. Well, I mean, that's what, that's what we're telling you. You're not in charge. Yeah. Okay? We need to rejoice in our being blessed to be bondservants. Bondservants of the Most High God. Remember what we saw in chapter 1, in verse 1, uh, here in the letter of James. Okay? How does it start? I'm sorry. James 1.1. 1, 1. You want me to read that? I do. I do. A bondservant by God. James, a bondservant by God, and of the Lord Jesus Christ. A bondservant is somebody who has been set free. Mm -hmm. And it was for freedom that Christ set us free. And we are free indeed. But a bondservant is somebody who says, I love you, and I don't want to leave you. No. I want to be with you. A bondservant is somebody who willingly submits himself. Okay? And that's what God is looking for, bond servants. It has to be your desire to serve God, or you never will serve God properly. 
And I, I have a question, if I may. Bond servants, does that mean that all Christians are bond servants? No, unfortunately, it doesn't mean that. Right. It doesn't mean that at all. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, some people uh, just do it because it's their obligation. It's, and, you know, if you're doing it, that's nice. And if you've accepted him and you're doing it, it's nice. But the simple fact of the matter is, our motivation in all things has to be love. I mean, go read what Paul wrote. If you do things, that's good. If you do things without love, your profit's nothing. Okay, we need to be serving God because we love Him. We need to be serving Jesus because we love Him, not because it's our obligation. That's very good. What happens in a lot of marriages that get to that point where they're they're not doing it out of love anymore. They're doing it out of obligation. Yeah. And if you're doing it out of obligation, that love is is in the process of Faith. falling, falling and failing, mm -hmm. right? So it says in four, verse 17, Therefore, to one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it is sin. So now, in addition to being taught about our actions, what we're supposed to do and not to do, we are now instructed by James against inaction. Yes. Failing to act. Failing to do what we know we should do. Paul wrote to the believers in, in the Colossian church that our speech should always be with grace, seasoned as it were with salt. Now, James, in his writing, surely believes the same thing, but it may often seem in his letter that it's like rubbing salt on a wound. Painful, but often healing. I, 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 I'll tell you this, I mean, James just doesn't pull punches here. No, he doesn't. He, he really doesn't. It's, um, to be blunt, James was often, very much like Jesus, very blunt. Mm -hmm. Righteous rudeness. I always call that righteous rudeness. Yeah. Because, you know, in the natural, you may perceive that as being rude. Mm -hmm. God can't do anything that's rude. No. He's in control of everything. But it has to be in love, all right? It has to be love. It has to be the truth, painful or not. But it has to be motivated by love. What I think a lot of people try to do is present things with flattery before they get to the root of it. Well, do yourself a little Bible study and see what God has to say about flattering lips. Not good. Not good at all. Not good at all. Get to the point. Jesus could be perceived as being rude at times. Mm -hmm. And the Apostle John, think about this difference. The Apostle John wrote in, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 by the way, mm -hmm. he said, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That is the word of God. That is true. That is God's truth. But James wrote, you adulteresses, mm -hmm. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility towards God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. James 4.4, 4, remember it? We just looked at it a week or two ago. There's a difference there. It doesn't make what John wrote wrong. But James is kind of like takes it to the next level. But he brings the seriousness of it no. to, to, to the front. The forefront. Is that harsh? No. No. If, if you think if you think it's harsh, listen to what Isaiah said. What God spoke to Isaiah. For this is a rebellious people, false sons, mm -hmm. sons who refuse to listen to the instruction of the Lord, who say to the seers, You must not see visions, and to the prophets, you must not prophesy to us what is right. Speak to us pleasant words. Prophesy illusions. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 30, verses 9 and 10. Isn't that what they, what Paul wrote to Timothy in the fourth chapter of the second letter? In the perilous last day, talking about that, he said, In the last days, men will not endure sound doctrine. Require teachers that will tickle their ears. So tickle their ears, telling them what they want to hear. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's what I just read from Isaiah. That led to the people in Isaiah 30, verse 11, saying, this is, this is God's 
people speaking to Isaiah, get out of the way. Turn aside from the path. Let us hear no more about the Holy One of Israel. Because I promise you, if you're not willing to hear the hard things, you will not want to hear more about the Holy One of Israel. It's like a step further. It's like saline solution. That, that, that came to me. We're the salt of the earth. Jesus yes. Christ, I mean, right? This is salt. Salt's a good thing. Absolutely. We just saw a documentary on with the animals, how much salt is so, required yeah. in their it's, it, it is a matter of life and death. Yes. Yes. Yeah. But the problem is, if, you, if you've ever had any experience at all, if you have any kind of wound and you rub salt on it, it helps you. It helps you. But it's but you're going to stink. <laughs> So sometimes the word of God is going to sure sting, but it truly brings healing. You know, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4.15, and said, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects of him who is the head, even Christ. we got to grow up. Edmund Burke. Now, Edmund Burke was an Irish-born English philosopher back in the 1700s. And he said, All that is necessary for the triumph of evil is that good men do nothing. Well, that's a good worldly picture of it. I mean, and but the simple fact of the matter is, it's not about what man does or what man doesn't do. It's about uh, us being obedient to God. You see, because that ver that verse, or that verse, that quote of, of Burke, is heard far more often than these verses in the Bible, but usually in a political context, and they are not, at least in application, truly synonymous. synonymous. It's not the same thing at all. To do the right thing. If you know the right thing, you've got to do it. The right thing is what the Word of God instructs. Right? Yeah. It's everything for you. Don't know. Life and God you don't have inherent knowledge of what the right thing is. But God's Word will tell you. The right thing to do is what the Word of God instructs us to do. But we need wisdom. And not the wrong kind. Again, I go back to something James said a little earlier. He said, this wisdom... Talking about worldly wisdom is not that which comes down from above, but it is earthly, natural, and demonic. We need the kind that comes down from above. We need godly wisdom. But we, we have it. Because we have, we have the godly wisdom, and we have the godly instruction that we are to do. We've been given everything pertaining to life and godliness, 2 Peter 1.3. We've been given everything. But if you don't do it, Remember that James had said earlier, but prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves, James 1.22. So we have to get in the practice, the practice of hearing the word. How often do you have to hear the word? All the time. <laughs> We're like blind people. Yes. I mean, we need, we need to be led. By the Spirit of God. To those who are being led by the Spirit of God, Paul says in Romans 8, those are the children of God. Otherwise, you're just stumbling around. And if you're not being led by what God says to you, you're not walking in faith. And if you're not walking in faith, anything not done in faith is sin. I can remember years ago when I was pastoring a church in Sanford, Florida. And this was on my heart. And I asked Alice to get up. Um, oh, yeah. And I said, I want you to close your eyes. And I'm going to tell you where to walk. Yeah, you stood in the back of the Room. And Alice it's walked all around there, through the, through the aisles and through the people in her room, purely based on what I told her to do. I did it very slow and cautiously. Well, but you did it because you trusted me. Yes. You did it because you loved me. Mm -hmm. And I asked you to do it. Yes. But that's faith. Walking blindly. Faith is is blind. You ever hear love is blind? Well, godly love is blind to the instruction of the world. And wise eyes wide open to the instruction of the word of God. Mm -hmm. Don't delude yourself. Don't believe for a minute that you have that knowledge within you that you need to live a right life. But the word of God gives you everything that you need. But you need to be then choosing to live according to the word. Living according to the instruction that God gives. Well, just thinking about what you said, love is blind. That makes so much sense now. Because it should be, if you're trusting in, in, in God, if you're trusting in Jesus, love is blind. Because you're not leaning on your own understanding, you're, you're being led by Him. 
And absolutely, so we, we have to be, we yeah. have to be led, led by Him. So true love is drawing. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. It's about what you hear. I mean, if you have one sense that is truly important, yeah, I, it is your hearing, your ability to hear the voice of God. Okay? It's, now, God gave us all five of our senses, and they're all important. But there's a good order to everything. God's in. And if you start living by what you see, you're going to find what an illusion this world can produce. It's time. Oh, my goodness. Whence goeth the time, as we say in King James? It flies right along. Well, I'm glad you could be with us. And, and I pray that you would consider what you're hearing here. More importantly, consider what you're hearing when you have conversations with God about what you've heard here. Because what you hear from God directly is certainly a, an awful lot more important than what you hear from me. All right? And then the other thing is now you have to live according to what you have heard from God. That's, that's the key to all of this. Put your faith in action. Faith that is not active is dead. God can't steer a parked bus. And we know that to be the truth. We do. All right. So say, yes, Lord, hear my, direct my feet. Thank you. Direct my path. Yes, Lord. Lord, I desire to do all you desire, not my own desire, Lord God. And I pray that our lives would be a living testimony to the power of God, to the love of God, to the living and true word of God. Because not one promise that he has promised has failed to come to pass. And I will tell you something that the word of God says. He's coming back. Hallelujah. I don't know when, I don't know the day, I don't know the hour. But I think, looking around me, that it grows closer. Be prepared. Be prepared for his coming. Be ready in season and out. Knowing that his love for you, how can you express it? Look at the cross. So we thank you, Father. We thank you, Father, for this time. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit that you sent to lead us into all truth. And above all, we thank you, Father, for the gift of your Son, Christ Jesus, who did for us what we absolutely could never do for ourselves, to take away the stain of our sin. In Jesus' name. Well, till next week, when we see you again, and I pray that we will see you again. And okay, you can write to us at officeatbiblebook.com. Tell us where you're watching from and what you You're welcome to send your comments. <laughs> We'd love to hear from you. Yes. So till then, may the Lord our God bless you and use you for the glory of his name. Amen. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.